fantastic. That's why I want to have good teams. Um, but sometimes you, you just can't give short shrift to the less glamorous side of leadership, which is making sure that the everyday things get done. That's what we have to do. Um, so a lot of what I talk about uh, is not going to be the day-to-day -day things that we cannot take for granted. And I'm talking about an organization, and your organization can be any combination of any of these things. Uh, and I think, you know, there's, there's no one right way to have statistics inside an organization, because if there was, every company would be doing it the same way. Um, so there's many different ways of doing it. Um, and, you know, just to prove that every day you can learn something new, I actually used wordcloud.com because I saw Allison do it in the draft of hers. So I put this together. So Dwayne said I talk about different types of organizations. Um, is your organization all sitting in the same office? Is your organization all around the world? You got people working from home? Is it basically a virtual organization? Um, are you all over geographic sites? Are you all over different cultures? Um, I'm talking about different corporate cultures. I'm talking about different society cultures. You need to understand how spread out your organization is over the culture map. You work for a Japanese company like I do, and you have an office in Osaka, and you've got another office in Forum Park, New Jersey, you are on opposite ends of the culture map. And you have to figure out how to negotiate that with the co because the company says we need to be global, we need to be fungible, we need to move resources back and forth. But there is just an enormous number of what I call mismatched expectations. Because people don't know what they don't know, and when cultures don't match, when something happens and you don't understand why, you fill it with your own perception, which is probably wrong. And so we have a lot of difficult but honest conversations about how to try to figure out where the common areas are in the culture. So you've got to figure out what the culture is. If you're going to be the leader of an organization, so exactly what are your short, medium, and long-term plans and your goals? What are you going to need to do to be competitive? What talent do you need to get there? How, how, what kind of software or hardware? Uh, and don't get caught up in the hot topic, but understand what it is. Because today's hot topic is data science and machine learning and artificial intelligence. And before that, you could come here and you couldn't throw a stone anywhere around the convention center because every session was adaptive design. And before that, everything was modeling and simulation and it was missing data. And these topics come and go. And then it was Bayesian. Um, they're going to come and go over time. As a statistician, you've got to recognize when is it a hot topic and when should it become part of your tool set. So when you're an organizational leader, you're going to get a question from the CMO or the head of research, and they're going to come to you and say, I had dinner with three other CMOs or three other heads of research, and their statisticians are all doing massive machine learning. What are we doing about it? <laughs> and, and my answer is, we're doing something that fits within the goals of our company. We don't have to do what they do because we have different goals. Um, I could just say, well, you're right, we need to do that. So I need 100 more people and about $100 million. So just pass it on over and that'll be fine. Um, but that's not the way to go. So you have to assess, is this hot? Is it necessary? Does it fit the goals of your organization? Um, and what do you need to do to be competitive? Because you need to understand where you're going. Uh, another example is the 21st Century Cures Act. If you Google 21st Century Cures Act, you're going to get a typical United States Congress document that's four or 500 pages long and unreadable. Um, but fortunately, there are people who read that and distill it for those of us who work in the pharmaceutical industry. And it tells us that essentially, there's, you don't need data from a nice, pretty, randomized clinical trial to maybe get a new indication. You can use real world data or electronic health record data. And so as somebody who has a data management group under them, I realize that everything that data management is doing needs to change over the next few years. I have to modernize data management because we could be getting data from electronic health records that needs to merge into our database. And these aren't coming from our own case report forms. Um, so you need to be looking into the future. You need to stay up on what's going on because it's your job not just to make sure the work gets done today, but it's your job to make sure that we can do the work in three, four years, five years. It's important to connect with other statistics leaders. It's one of the great parts of JSM. Walk around, meet other leaders, talk to them, see what else is going on. But even in a simple sense, it's also important just to know the people who work for you, uh, learn their names. It's really important to talk to people by their name. I mentioned
mentioned before, spontaneous mentoring and teachable moments, but there's also planned mentoring. So you can, you can mentor people. I have monthly meetings with my direct reports about career development. I set one up when I got to Shinogi with somebody uh, who had worked in the industry for 15 years. And when he walked into my office, he said, you know, I've never had one of these meetings before. And I was, and my only reaction was, geez, I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, you gotta be thinking about this, and this is my job to make sure that we're talking about your career. Uh, because I believe that the function of leadership is to produce more leaders. We're not supposed to be producing followers. Um, and nobody's gonna make a great leader who wants to do everything by themselves, um, or try to get to credit. <laughs> so you gotta really be developing your people. If you're a senior leader in charge of an organization, it's likely you've been around for a long time and you've got a lot of experience, so you've got to share it. Um, but you don't have to mentor just within your organization. You mentor across organizations. Uh, I've been doing that because I have a lot of experience in a lot of things, including probably going to FDA, well, not probably, definitely going to FDA more times than I can possibly count. I've just lost track of the number of times I've gone to FDA. And so I go to every FDA prep meeting in my company to coach them, even if I don't really know the product, just to help prepare people to go. Because I'm mentoring across all the organizations and functions, because I have that experience. Not particularly statistics, but I've been to enough to know how these meetings work. Um, and then the other thing is to try to tell people that there's a cycle. And basically, this is, this is how clinical trials are developed. Um, it's what you know, what you know that you don't know, what you don't know that you don't know. So if you design a clinical trial, you base it on what you know. And then the hypothesis and the objectives are addressing what you know that you don't know. And now you run the trial, all sorts of new things pop up, which tells you all the things that you didn't know that you didn't know. And at the end of the trial, this cycle continues and you build on that. But it's the same thing about building an organization, and it's the same thing about you building your career. As you start moving up, you know what you know right now, and you know what you want to learn. But as you go up, you're going to find out there's a bunch of things you didn't know that you didn't know. So this sort of cyclical thinking is how you should be building on anything. It's a great paradigm to do clinical trial development, but it's a really good paradigm also just for your career. So one of the key things about being a manager, uh, Harvard Business Review says you should be a promoter, not an inhibitor. It's a lot like what Dwayne was talking about, uh, about simplifying things. You don't want to inhibit what your group is doing. You want to, you want to make sure it's working well. But another key point is, sometimes you gotta be tough. Sometimes you just, you know, I wanna do everything full influence, I want everybody to agree, but sometimes you're the boss, you gotta say, no, this is what we're doing. You have to do that. You should explain why you're saying that, but sometimes that's the way it has to work. Um, so you should try to be fair, but remember, when you're in charge of an organization, we're being fair to the company. We don't have to be fair to all of you. We have to be fair to the company, that's who hired us and that's our job. So if you think being fair means that I should be promoting everybody who reports to me, just remember if I promote everybody, then nobody's really been promoted. I have to promote the people who deserve to be promoted. That's being fair to my company, and that's being fair to each person individually, but it's not treating everybody the same. So those are two different things. And you should hold people accountable. Uh, you should talk to people and find out why they did things uh, and make people take responsibility uh, for what they're doing. So if you want to get good things done, you've got to hire good people. Um, hire people who know things you don't. I don't know everything, so I want to hire people who can fill in those gaps. That's, that's the easiest way for me to make sure things are going on. Um, but hire people with potential. If you are sitting around with your group of people who did an interview or a candidate, and everybody agrees the person can do the job, the next question I ask is, okay, but they can, can they do the next job? Can they do the next level and the level after that? And if the answer is no, we're not hiring that person. Because I'm not hiring anybody I can't promote. So that person is just going to get stuck. I want people with potential as well as people who can come in and do the job. And when I'm looking to hire a manager or promote somebody to manager, one of the questions I ask in the interview is, tell me about tough conversations you've had. And if they can't ever remember having a hard conversation with someone, maybe a, a conversation that they know is going to make the person uncomfortable, uh, then I don't think they really have the experience to be a manager yet. You have to be able to have hard conversations, difficult conversations. And you have to know how to have those conversations. And the last is, if you're an organizational leader, you cannot be afraid to make a decision. You have to make a decision. That's your job. That's why they hired you. Um, but if you're going to make decisions, don't
don't be a maximizer. In other words, don't take forever to figure out what the best possible solution or decision is going to be. Think about what's the most likely outcome of the decision you want to make. And then think about the worst outcome. And if you're happy with the most likely and you can live with the worst outcome, then don't stress over what the best possible outcome would be. Move on, make a decision, and keep moving. I also believe in constrained creativity. Everybody's job has some routine parts to it. But I work in a regulated industry, and there's certain rules we have to follow. And in doing that, I need to know that for my organization to work, I need consistency. I need work instructions that everybody can follow. Um, but I don't want people to be bored, so I want people to be creative. So I have to tell them and figure out how to be creative, but I have to have constraints on that to make sure that the work gets done. And for statisticians, it's important to be a scientist and a trialist and not a calculator. If you work in the pharmaceutical industry, read the whole protocol. Or if you're somebody who works on grants, read the entire grant. Um, I ran into this issue early on in my career where I walked into a document review committee meeting where we read the protocol. And I had a comment on the inclusion exclusion criteria. And the person in charge of the review said, we're not at the stats section yet. We'll get to you. And I was like, <laughs> Okay, so my first three or four gut reactions I put aside, uh, and I basically pointed out why I had to make a comment and how it was not connecting to the rest of the study. And again, you're influencing people, you're adding value, you're becoming part of the team, and now people are okay with you talking about the rest of the protocol. Uh, but there's a lot of people out there who are trying to pigeon statisticians into just that piece. Uh, but don't be a calculator, be a scientist, be a clinical. And the key to successful leadership today is influence, not authority. So you've got to take, take initiative, advocate for your ideas in your organization. If you see a problem, especially at an organizational leader level, propose a solution. I can't walk around complaining about things. I have to have answers. Um, and that's, that's different. It's okay when you're younger. If you see problems, you can talk to your manager and try to work something out. But you get to a certain level where you have to be able to have a solution to any problem. a couple of more quotes that I like here. The supreme quality for leadership is unquestionably integrity. So years ago when I was a younger statistician, I was working on a paper. Everybody wants to publish the results of their trial. It was a very successful non-inferiority trial. In fact, it was so successful that the drug actually turned out in a post hoc sense to be superior. And uh, from that end, when they started writing the paper to submit to the journal, all the commercial people wanted to write would have been a significant p-value if there was a superiority hypothesis. And so they wrote that into the conclusion that the drug was not only non-inferior, but it was superior. And I said, no, you can't say that. That's not how the study was designed. You had no superiority hypothesis. And they absolutely insisted that's how the paper was going. So I said to them, okay, that's fine. Take my name off the paper. I don't want to be a co-author. And they looked at me and said, you can't do that. And I said, I don't see rules that say I can't do that. So I go back to my office, and next thing I know, of course, my phone rings, and my boss is calling me and calls me into his office. And he says, I heard about what you did. And I said, yeah. And he says, you were right. He says, and that paper's not going to go through clearance unless they take that st statement out of there. But it was integrity. It was statistics. I had to protect it. That was my job. Uh, I don't need one more co-authorship. Uh, what I need is to make sure my name is on papers that are doing things right. And then, as I said before, you need to be disagreeable, not nasty, but you need to be disagreeable. Meaning, sometimes I'm the only person in the room who thinks one way and everybody thinks the other way. And I'm not wrong. So you can't be afraid to disagree no matter how many other people think something if you know you're right. And that's something that takes a lot of experience and courage uh, to do. And certainly it's sometimes better as an organizational leader to stand back, not stand out. I'm very happy if everybody who works for me gets all the credit. I don't need the credit. I'm already a VP. I've had a good career. I'm an ASA fellow. I'm happy. I did good. Okay? I need everybody else to do that. Um, but if things get tough, I'm going to step in front and take it because that's my job. So my job is to enable people to do what they do. My job is to create capacity. I want everybody's day to get simpler. I want standards. I want my programmers to have standards so they don't have to spend time recreating the wheel, and then they get capacity. I want my organization to help other organizations get things done better because we have an expertise, and that creates capacity for the whole company. And I want to look at 
big, broad objectives. I don't want to look at local objectives. I want to look at the big things that are going on and really help the company move forward on a large scale level because that's what you can do at a higher level that you can't do in any other level. So in summary, um, I'm taking this from Ken Langone's book. Uh, he was co-founder of Home Depot. Uh, and he wrote about his travels and development of Home Depot, but it actually turns out to be an interesting book on leadership. And you really teach values by living them. You don't say things, you actually do them. Uh, and, and I believe that. I also, I also believe in being ravenous in reading. I read a lot of stat stuff. And I read the parts. You can't read everything. It's too big a field. Um, but I read what I think is interesting. I also read a lot about reader, leadership. And since I've been at Shinoki, I read an awful lot about how to deal with different cultures. Um, but I find it interesting. And I find it fun to do because it's, it's part of my job. Um, and here's the part where I will talk about money. Um, money solves the problems that money can solve. But you've got to understand it's limits. Money can do everything. You know, maybe if you're the New York Yankees, you can throw money at every problem. <laughs> Uh, but for the rest of us, you got to realize money doesn't solve everything. And the last thing is, you're going to fail, so what? Keep going. Something's going to work. Don't worry about failure. Learn from your failure. I got these sort of quotes hanging in my office. If somebody walks in and tells me something went wrong, and they're afraid I'm going to be mad, I just point at the quotes. And I say, no, it's okay. Now what are we going to learn from it so it doesn't happen again? If you're working for somebody who you don't really think is a good boss, think about why they're not a good boss and learn from that. Because you can learn just as much from things that you don't want to do as things that you do. I've learned from everybody I've ever reported to, good or better. Um, and then my, fa my favorite part here, um, every time you speak, you're auditioning for leadership. Every time you're in a meeting and you say something, if there's leaders in the room, they're looking at you. And we're looking at you and trying to figure out what are your qualities. You're always auditioning for leadership. And I'm not trying to make you nervous when you talk. But we're looking for the future leaders. And so when you're up there and you're talking in a little meeting or one-on-one, -on -one, or we're watching you work with your teams, you're auditioning for leadership. Uh, so I want to thank all the presenters in this session because they all gave me really good feedback on my talk. Um, and the last person up there, JT, is my son. And he's on his way to college. He's going to Elon University in August. And he's already telling me that he's going to take their leadership minor. You have a minor in leadership. And it's across all sorts of different departments. He's fascinated by the idea of leadership. I don't know where he gets that from. And <laughs> so I ran this talk past him. And it was a great conversation uh, for me. And it's, you know, it's always good to talk to your son like that also. Um, but uh, he actually helped improve the presentation. So if I told him, I give him credit. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. So, hello everyone. Leadership. We all want it, right? We all want to be led by great people. We want to be led by folks that are smart, that we respect, that we want to lead, uh, to lead us, that make good decisions. If we are uh, leading others or we're showing up in the room, we want to do the right thing. We want people to follow us. We want to be making an impact. We want to add value. We want to influence. Everyone wants leadership. It's elusive though, isn't it? It's hard to find. Look at industry. So CEOs uh, coming and going at a variety of companies. Uh, uh, executives uh, coming and going. Operating models changing. Everything is outsourced. Everything is, is insourced. Uh, new technology that people are very uh, excited about comes on the scene. And then a few years later it's torn down because it doesn't work. 
leadership matters. And why is it so hard to find? I think it's hard to find because great leadership is a perfect storm of all the qualities that you have heard today. It's about technical expertise, professional competency, but it's also judgment, uh, personal character traits like humility and integrity and character and virtue. And, and, and um, personal attributes along those lines, and then there's a sense of awareness as well. And so those don't come naturally to all people. And think about us now, we're mathematicians, right? We grow up in the field, we like math, and all of a sudden we're in the field of statistics, and statistics is a leadership field. It, it, it's, it's not a uh, calculation field. And so now we have an entire skill set that we may not quite be ready for. Do we have a problem in the field of statistics with leadership? Maybe. I think we have a potential problem. I think that the theme this year is somewhat remedial. I think that if you look carefully around industry, you can see sort of this cycle where in certain settings, statisticians fail to lead, and then they're not expected to lead, and then they're not desired to lead, and then finally they're not allowed to lead. And you heard a little bit about that in Bruce's pushback. Uh, you see that in organizations where statistics reports into the wrong place, uh, where statistics doesn't sit in the right governance. Okay, and so I think we do have a little bit of a problem. I know we have the solution. The solution is in this room. The solution is walking the halls of this convention center. We certainly uh, can lead with statistics and lead our way through the challenges uh, that we find ourselves in, but we must do it, and there's no other answer besides ourselves. So we heard from four exceptional leaders today, and uh, started with Allison, and she referenced something, I'll reference something from the, the sports world, but the New England Patriots are one of the most successful franchises in sports history, and they have a motto. And their motto is not about winning championships, their motto is, do your job. And that's where she started, and that's great advice to the entry-level statistician. Uh, you will stand out if you do your job. You will earn trust. As a leader, I'm looking constantly and I'm asking myself the question, who can I trust? Who can I count on? Who will come through? Who will step up? And so if you do that, you will stand out. Um, build your network. Begin to connect with people because it will uh, help you when you get to Yao Bing's stage. So Yao Bing is talking about leading without authority. How in the world do you do that? How do you lead without authority? Well, you do have authority. You have moral authority. You have the power of your ideas. And so I think the key to leading without authority is being right. You have to have the best idea in the room, or a good idea in the room, or ideas that can be pivoted off of to move things in the right direction. If you have bad ideas and poor judgment, you will never be able to lead without authority because you will be ignored, and you should be ignored. So what you want to do at that stage is you want to develop, you want to learn. You want to know the disease, the guidance, the endpoints, the methods better than anybody else, and you can do this. And when you start bringing answers to your teams, instead of just questions, you will begin to have influence, very powerful influence, and you will begin to lead without authority. Um, but it's not just enough to be right. It's not just enough to have the right answer. You have to be able to explain why. You have to be able to articulate it, uh, because sometimes there can be resistance, and so you need to be patient, and you need to walk people through it. If you've had the network built, that Allison mentioned, then you've got connection to these people and you can have that conversation uh, in a fairly comfortable fashion. All right, Dwayne talked about management. You've arrived, you have the power, right? You are the boss. So things should get really easy, right? You just impose your will on the organization, you tell them what to do. Well, this is the place where I think many people derail. Many people take the shortcut of thinking that organizational power is leadership, and it is not. It is actually a great responsibility because now you affect people. You affect what they experience, you affect their productivity, you, you affect what they bring to you, and you affect them as a team and as a group. And so you've got that responsibility. You have to make a great shift, and it's the shift to being an enabler, a supporter, one who creates an environment where others can do great things, 
based on the input guidance and framework that you provide. Um, the bad boss syndrome that Dwayne mentioned is real. Think about that. People leave bosses. It's hard to leave a boss. It's hard to leave a company, and people do it. They do it every day. And so um, it's, it, we affect people's lives when we leave. We need to take that responsibility very, very, uh, uh, very seriously. And this is also, I think, where who we are matters as people. So think about who you are as a person. Are you healthy? Are you secure? Do you have the virtues like a big heart? Humility, moral compass, courage, um, integrity, self-sacrifice. Do you put yourself first? Are you selfish or are you selfless? These characters in us emerge at the managerial stage. And I can tell you that these uh, qualities are fundamental in my mind to being an effective leader. And if you do not have these qualities, it will be very difficult. So you want to start looking at yourself. Look in the mirror and say, okay, who am I? Who really am I? And you want to go on that personal, personal growth exercise in order to be the kind of leader you want to be. We're really talking here about authenticity. And I can promise you that your organizations know. They know exactly who you are. They know exactly what you're made of. Um, even if you don't, they do. There's this idea of emotional intelligence. Do you have the awareness to know yourself and others? At the managerial level, we talked about hiring. Very important. Everyone talks about it. I think few people do it well. I think we hope. We talk to someone. They have a PhD from a school. We have a conversation, and we hope for the best. Okay, be very, don't settle when you hire. I've never seen anybody that sort of surprises to the upside when they hire. I think most of the time, you, 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 they surprise to the, to the downside if, if you're not very selective. So be selective, because 25% of the right person is worth more than 100% of the wrong person. Um, and so now we have the organizational leader that, that Bruce described. And he said it so well. Everything is magnified at the organizational level. And so the impact is huge. And so if you aspire to organizational leadership, it's wonderful because you can make a huge impact both on people, on organization, on you know, healthcare, all of that. You can also make a huge negative impact. Uh, if you take two identical organizations and give one a good leader and one a bad leader, you will end up with two very different organizations at the end of the day. So it matters. You have to have that awareness. You have to really understand that at that level, every strength you have and every weakness you have will be magnified. And that's why it's so important to be the kind of person that deserves to be followed. Um, it really matters. Think about passion, creativity, and innovation. So what do these things have in common? Well, everybody wants them, right? Not everyone gets them. And you can't force them. You can't buy them. You can't say, I'm the boss, so get out there and be passionate. Get out there and innovate. You can't. These are gifts your employees bring you. They bring them of their own free will. So you have to step back and say, okay, you know, you have all the power in the world, but actually you feel pretty powerless. How do you, how do, you do this? How do you create this environment? Well, that's actually what you're doing. You're creating an environment. You're the custodian of the ecosystem. And the creator of that ecosystem that you live in, you provide the soil, air, food, and water that your people live in. And so uh, that's really the challenge of organizational leadership, creating that kind of environment so that they can be their best. And, and there's a sense of stimulation and challenge, and yes, truth and accountability. And then there's the nurturing side of that as well. But you really are the creator of that world. And it's very... Um, it's satisfying to be able to create that um, because you will set the culture, you will set the subculture, and you want to do it well because it really matters. Another aspect I want to touch on uh, is the concept of being outside your comfort zone. As you advance in your career, you'll become more and more uncomfortable. Uh, and at the organizational leadership level, you will be uh, very uncomfortable, probably all the time. And that's okay. 